Well, thanks very much, Ian, for that uh, brief introduction. We have a, a very diverse panel here today, representing different roles in the market. And I, what we thought we would do is look at liquidity, which is the topic, from each of their perspectives, because they do have very different roles. Uh, but introducing them, introducing myself first, I'm James Sinclair, as, as Ian said, from Market Factory. We're a, we're a technology vendor. My own background is I used to work for EBS right from the beginning. Before that, I was at Citibank for more years than I should record. Um, on the panel today, we have Takis Baropoulos. Takis is the head of e-commerce for CIBC. He had a similar role at Merrill Lynch before, and uh, I was at previously at Dresner and started life as a quant. Lars Holst, he's at CFH. He's the founder and CEO of CFH Markets. Uh, Lars was previously with Saxo, Dresner, and Curranex. David Nunes is the uh, you have so many titles now, David. You're the Senior Vice President at State Street, Head of Caranex globally, and you're also running a, a, a SAF, SwapEx. Isaac Lieberman, who is now on the buy side, he is the CEO of Aston Capital Markets and was previously a very well-known trader at Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan Chase. So he's, done the, he's crossed the Rubicon and Andrew Relish, who's the CEO and founder of One Zero, which is, uh, today you're really representing the gateway to the retail community. So we have representatives from retail, buy side, a venue, uh, a clearing institution, and a commercial bank, so across the board. As I said, I hope we can put together a picture of how liquidity is, is affected by each of these actors in the space because the foreign exchange market has changed greatly over the last 20 years. Certainly when I began, you had just commercial banks, customers, and venues, and that were brokers, and that was it. Now it's much more complicated. But before we get there and work out how it's all pieced together in liquidity, there is one issue which is, I think, quite topical, but hopefully very temporary and that is the volatility over the last few months has been extremely low. I mean, we, over the, if you look back, we've had, in volume terms, we've had 12% compound annual growth rate in FX since 1989. In terms of volumes, it's been great. It's, we have more people trading FX than ever before. There are more Reuters workstations, there are more endpoints than ever before. But the volatility since April has been um, very low, and I think most of us in this room have an interest in seeing volume and volatility. So is it, is it temporary, or what, what's going on there? Maybe Takis, you can uh, help us out a bit as the banker here. Yeah, I mean, th there's a number of views in the market. Uh, I have my own views. Some of them are more controversial than others. I'll give you first a macro view. I mean, the underlying factor in our industry is really growth. And if you look at the growth potential, it has slowed down. If you look at the growth in China, it has slowed down. It's still growing, but it has slowed down. So it has implications for the movement of goods around the globe. It has implications for commodities. It's not just foreign exchange. The commodities volatility is one of the lowest. And if the commodity movement around the globe is not happening, the natural business for foreign exchange is not happening either. So people are looking at growth. That doesn't mean there isn't enough money. There's a lot of money, but it's just sitting on the sides. So there's less, I would say, investment. People are just waiting to see. That's kind of the macro level view. Um, people would like, obviously, for volatility to come back. I think it will do so, um, maybe in a few months. The more controversial view is linked to what's happening recently in the FX industry. So, and it's got to do with some of the, I would say, side effects from regulation. Um, we have seen um, a number of uh, proprietary desks in the banks um, shut down. The market making is going to uh, non-financial institutions like hedge funds and so on. Right. That doesn't mean they trade less, but the banks are taking smaller positions and less frequently. So anecdotally, given the issues with the um, the, the, the benchmarking, the fixings in London, there are fewer senior traders in the large banks. Now, not all the flow is necessarily you know, client-driven. The flow, uh, there is some positioning, 
And if the people are not there to take those positions to facilitate client flow, then there's less movement in the market. So there's a few forces, I think, right now in the industry that kind of contributing. By the way, neither of those sounded like very temporary conditions. Slow growth in China and the fact that we have fewer dealers in the banks due to um, the regulation issues. I Isaac, you're also trading. Do you feel, uh, do you have a view on this? Well, you know, my view is that in the markets, you, at the end of the day, you have two players. You have end users and you have speculators. And each of them takes market risk because they anticipate uh, change in the market, which is usually dr driven by a theme. Now, most of the themes that have worked before, which have been consistent based on previous experience, have not played through. Um, this has a lot to do with, um, you know, the government. You have a big government intervention in the U.S. and and Europe, and it affects all asset classes through the correlations. So what happens is, you know, people start out in January with a fresh P and L, mm -hmm. and as you get this decay of themes not following through, the participation goes down less and less and less. So it gets to a point like where we're at, where you're waiting for an overwhelming <coughs> theme to come to market, which will actually induce the market to, ch to move, in which case people will anticipate change and come back in and take risk. I mean, they have to take risk. People have to balance their risk offsets and users, and people have to make money as speculators. So one thing I know about foreign exchange, um, don't sell it short. It always comes back, and it will right. come back um, when it starts trending. But the timeline is going to really um, take, take place when you have an overwhelming theme, which has continuity. So we need to wait for a little bit more continuity before it comes back. But that, at least it will come back. It always comes back. Yeah. FX always comes back. I mean, think of 1996, 95, 96. People were talking about the euro is going to come out, uh, fixed exchange rates, right. nothing's yeah, going to move. And um, it's all over. It's going to become a utility vehicle. That's what they said, you know, when I started trading. And it just became, we saw phenomenal growth in foreign exchange trading since then. So no, that's a, it really that's comes down right, to end yeah. users and speculators needing to adjust their positions. Is it, is it, we think we're at an interesting point is the question is you know, how much is cyclical and how much is secular in terms right. of what's happening. Uh, from, a, from a cyclical perspective, we have had periods of low volatility before. Uh, the mid-90s and the mid-2000s were historically low in terms of uh, the volatility. In fact, what, in fact many sort of uh, things are very much in sort of reflecting where the markets were in, uh, in around 2007, uh, which is an interesting uh, sort of point to reflect against. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the kind of concern that I have is, so fine, so uh, I agree that, uh, that volatility will return, and I think the longer it remains at a very low level, the probably the, 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 uh, the more aggressive the snapback to volatility would be. Uh, the question is how much, is, um, how, how much secular change has there been? And I think, and, and, and sort of to echo Takas' points, the, uh, there has been definitely sort of impact of the benchmark uh, sort of investigations and the removal of all these players from the marketplace. The other thing that we've also seen uh, is that the, there seems to have been a significant decline in, what, in noise trading um, within the marketplace because mm. a lot of the standard communication mechanisms, which were very traditional in FX, where counterparties would convey information uh, to each other about you know, color in the marketplace, what they were seeing going on, which was probably sort of magnifying uh, orders across the market as, uh, as, as that information was spread around. Uh, those chat rooms have obviously been slow, sort of shut down in some cases. And certainly, there's a great reticence to get involved in that sort of uh, interaction with your customers whilst whatever the new normal sort of arrives at when it comes to how you should be communicating with your counterparties. Yeah. So I think that, that's something which is also impacting and, uh, and whether that ever comes back uh, is questionable. And the question, therefore, is how much of the market was actually being influenced by that kind of, a tra that kind of trading? Uh, absolutely. There, as as I says, the market is very good at coming back from these things when it happens. We lost 30% of the volume in 1999 when we had the euro, and we did come back. We came back in about three years. Um, but certainly the secular factors that Takis mentioned uh, are, are burdening us down right now. So that's true. Um, let's get to the main issue of how do the, in this new world where it's a more complex world with more different players, than ever before in the FX market. How does it fit together? Um, as I mentioned earlier, originally we had a very clear, everybody knew their place. You had commercial banks, you had customers, and you had brokers, and that was about it. 
now we have a number of new actors. I mean, one of them is Isaac, who's sitting here. Another is Andrew, representing the retail community. Isaac, I mean, you, you have now crossed from the sell side, where, as I said, you were an active trader at J.P. Morgan Chase and quite well known, to the buy side. So when you, are you now a customer of the banks or are you a market maker or, or how, how do you fit in? How do you tell, what do you tell the banks that you are? Well, I see myself as a customer because I'm participating as an opportunistic trader. Um, you know, when you think about the market today versus what you were referencing in the past, today we're in a technology-driven market. And by definition, technology opens up, you know, new access points and redistributes players. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to the same things, right? You have people who are warehousing risk. You have people who have direct relationships with customers. And then you have people who are opportunistic traders. So by definition, what I do is purely opp opportunistic. I have no customers, direct relationships with customers. So even if I put a passive quote in the market, which is defined as a market-making quote, it really isn't because I don't have a connection to that customer. And I could be in the market. I could be out of the market. So at the end of the day, the banks who um, have the relationships with the customers, who have responsibility for the orders, and they have a fiduciary duty um, to maintain um, you know, price stability, um, that's what I would call a true market maker. Um, the fact that I can be a market maker and supporting the market as a market maker right. is essentially providing liquidity as a customer. When, the, when I get traded on, my order gets filled, which it satisfies my opportunity. And the banks must push back and say, you know, I know you, Isaac, you were, you were in a, a large trader. And how do I know your, fill, your flow is going to be interesting to the bank? Well, what we're looking to do today is calibrate our flow to the liquidity provider or to the liquidity pool and source. I think that's very important to understand that numbers, the flow is not just numbers on your screen or data coming in through a feed. There's a catalyst behind each one of those numbers uh, driven by a business need or a, a customer demand or something. And the more you can understand um, the reason why prices are coming down a pipe, Mm -hmm. the more you could calibrate your trading to complement it. And that is what banks like, because at the end of the day, banks want to have a mutual trading relationship. So that's very important. By the way, if anybody else wants to chime in from the audience, please feel free. Um, the other changes that are happening right now in this market uh, progressively, certainly, David, uh, you're, you are the head of Carnex globally. A few years ago, there were essentially four venues out there. There was Reuters, EBS, Carnex, and Hotspot that were material. Now, we can count large numbers of venues. We connect to 56 venues. So, David, in this new world, is, is liquidity impacted by having so many venues out there? I mean, in theory, you would think that there's a lot more adverse selection that could take place because people are making prices into so many places. Yes, certainly, I think you know, the market is very dynamic in terms of what's happened uh, right. over the last few years as new venues have appeared on the on, on the marketplace uh, in the uh, in the market, and the interaction between those uh, those venues, uh, which is basically facilitated by the participation uh, by the participants on those venues, uh, has become more and more of a significant factor in how liquidity functions. And we hear an awful lot of our uh, of our customers um, kind of concerned around the. Uh, the, the sort of massive information leakage that you get, especially when you're trading on the primary venues, how that Im immediately affects the, uh, the prices on the secondary venues. And therefore, and by secondary, it's kind of getting a bit blurry as to what is primary and what is secondary as the, uh, as the traditional sort of stalwarts in the marketplace have seen significant sort of volume declines over the last sort of 24 months in comparison to the other, in terms of what used to be secondary venues. So, Ways to, uh, ways to sort of minimize the impact on the market of your trading uh, are becoming more and more sort of popular um, uh, sort of initiatives that various organizations are taking. Uh, we've obviously uh, come up with solutions to, re to, uh, to respond to that. Uh, so ways to, en to ensure that when you do want to get done, you get done in your, in your full amount rather than you, s you try and sweep the book and don't get done for you know, h half of it because, uh, and then the market moves against you and then you end up in a position that you're, you're going to get out of in a way that is, uh, is obviously adverse to what you're intending to do. Right. If you said that, um, you mentioned that the major venues have lost volume over the last 24 months, which is clearly true. They've lost volume and they've lost share. Um, is, it how, is it possible 
I know you're working for Carnex, but is it possible for them to get it back? Uh, I think it's, it's kind of difficult because the, uh, unless you're, um, well, a lot of the sort of the adventures that uh, our competitors have gone on uh, over the last 24 months in terms of their change of strategy, I don't think necessarily ref were, uh, were an appropriate reflection of where the market had got itself to, especially when right. it came to the sort of the technological innovation of the participants. So liquidity aggregation uh, means now that you have essentially sort of robots determining where your order flow is going, especially as a, uh, as a sort of a bank participant taking liquidity on these platforms. Uh, from that perspective, if you're not ensuring that you're catering to, uh, to that sort of an integration, uh, then, then you're going to have trouble um, sort of maintaining your market share because other platforms will try and focus on making sure that they interact as effectively as possible uh, with those liquidity aggregators. Uh, therefore, turning or changing course and trying to get back in there um, is going to be a sort of a surprising move, I suppose, to make in the first place uh, and be somewhat challenging from a technological perspective to get, sort of, to get back in. Uh, um, um, adding to what David said, that there's another factor which is also very important, that technological advancements these days are such that even smaller players, smaller banks, can take direct feeds from other banks. And we have seen it in our place as well. We have bilateral relationships with a number of the, the tier one banks, the, the top five, six in the Euro Money service, and we can trade with them directly via APIs. And one of the effects is such that if our traders or our electronic systems trade with the other banks directly, the market doesn't actually see what is happening. You can't see Caronex moving or Hotspot or EBS or Reuters because as we do, as we warehouse liquidity, the banks warehouse liquidity as well. So right. there's the effect of internalization. And so I think it will be very difficult for the bigger players to actually get that volume back. In fact, I would probably say it's gonna continue to go down. Um, if we see some consolidation in the market, mm -hmm. then yes, you can see something. But as things are right now, I think it will be very difficult to get it back. Interesting. Lost especially it. especially when we don't pay any brokerage, but when we deal directly with banks. Lars, do you have a view? No, I, I, I agree with, you know, of course, uh, the old colleagues uh, mm -hmm. to my left and my right, they represent what I would call the, the old world. Uh, and, and of course, uh, today, uh, I think uh, Andrew might uh, uh, second that, but we, we don't see any decline in business. We, we see phenomenal growth right now. Uh, the volume is driven by innovation, it's, it's driven by technology, and, and the ones that can kind of uh, adapt quicker, uh, they, they will win. Uh, you know, I think we, we have shown that ourselves. But you're, and of you're course, in, in, in this country, uh, the market is completely ruined uh, because of regulation. Uh, and, and people just go elsewhere, but, but where we see the growth, uh, sh uh, surely, is, is, is in Asia, where they're not uh, let, so let, burdened by... We'll come back regulation. to the regulation, but the, your comment about uh, you're seeing growth, you are an agency business, so it, in fact you're backing Takis up, that you're saying that it's the relationship trading which is growing, not the ECN-like trading. I think we, we uh, out, well, we distribute technology as well, you know, together with uh, One Zero uh, uh, as an example, and we, we just see that, that the market participants are, are going out of the market, uh, you know, here in, in the US. Recently, uh, another mm. one of your big brokers uh, sold their retail book to, to right. FXCM, so I guess they, they're last man standing these days. Uh, but, uh, you know, elsewhere, in, 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 again, in, in Asia, uh, we were in, in Shanghai, I think, uh, the week before last, and uh, there was some uh, a guy on the ground, he, he told us that uh, there's around 1,000 brokers now operating in, in China. 1,000. So, so, you know, I don't think in, in China that they will uh, agree with uh, the, the view that, that the market is in, in decline. Uh, no. The market is just moving where it's more interesting and where it's easier to do business. By the way, I don't think anybody is saying the market is in decline in overall. The CLS volumes keep going up. The spreads have relative to other asset classes kept, it's spread compression, but it's nothing like other asset classes. And there are more traders, as I said before. Um, and Andrew, yes, you, for you, you're, you're the gateway to the retail space. Tell us what kind of liquidity are your customers looking for today versus they were a year ago? And what kind of liquidity they're looking for uh, f after that? And I have a follow-up question to that. Great. Well, I think Lars put it very well that it, it, 
it's not necessarily that the, the, the centralized or the, the overall volume or the overall activity is declining. It's these nodes that are popping up, either non-bank participants getting into making liquidity right. or new areas of the world where retail trading or FX trading is just starting, such as out in Asia, or just starting to blossom and going through a maturation cycle that we've seen here in the U.S. and we've seen the consolidation happen. And I think where the larger venues are, are really struggling is that trying to bring everything into one point, trying to replicate the exchange model that we're so used to or, or, or everyone's very familiar with from the equity space doesn't work in this fragmented model. Right. It's not going to happen. You're not going to get every retail broker in Asia or, or, or around the world eventually to pool up into one massive ECN. So what technology providers such as One Zero and, and, and a number of firms that are approaching this space is doing is not trying to bring all the liquidity to one point, but creating almost a web, uh, embracing that fragmentation by providing interconnectivity between these different brokers. So explain explain what who is at the end points of these this web. Is it bank to customer? It's not necessarily even having one of these major ven venues or a bank involved anymore. It, it's, it's customer. It's to retail customer? brokers trading to retail brokers, offsetting risk against each other, building pools and, and building out liquidity in Asia, in Tokyo, and, and in places where traditionally you would think, oh, it has to come back to New York, so it has to hit one of the top four in order to be a, a, a trade that agencyed up. But no, you can make markets, it's an over-the-counter industry, and you're going to see in these different areas of the world these webs get created of insulated liquidity nodes that may never come back. So these liquidity nodes are between customers, they're not retail brokers, there's no bank involved. There can be a bank involved, there can be a non-bank involved. I, I think that the concept of an aggregator, which was traditionally thought of as a big venue that brought a number of market makers together, mm -hmm. is actually more of a plumbing piece now that you see, and, and it might be a retail broker as you traditionally see it, participating as a market maker now or taking the place of a bank when interacting with these other smaller brokers as they're coming up in these new areas of the world. Yeah, we're, um, we're certainly seeing that as well, is that local matching you know, is something which people are, are looking for where they want to meet their counterparties locally rather than um, trying to all focus everything in, in, the same, in the same place. There's definitely a sort of a, an all-to-all -all wherever uh, sort of model that's emerging uh, as, the, as the sort of ecology gets richer from both a participant perspective and a geographical perspective. Right, Takish? In order to trade in the FX markets, you need credit. Right. Right? It's bilateral relationships, you need credit. Credit is key. Without credit, nothing happens. Right? Without credit, on the, in the retail space, you have margin, margin trading, you have delivery versus payment in the commercial space. Right? But for the bigger volumes, you need credit. And all the market makers, including some of the hedge funds, even the high-frequency funds that make markets, or the retail aggregators and so on, they also need credit. And they trade using the credit of one of the larger prime brokers. Mm -hmm. right? So what's happened is there are two things. You have banks not taking proprietary risk, not taking as much market making risk as they were doing before. You have non-financial institutions, non-banks doing so in the bank's name. So we shifted the, the risk from a, a trading risk to more like a, a credit risk. So to answer your question, the flow does get reflected back in the bank but in terms of credit rather than trading risk. Right. In, in which case, I, I have one question, and then I want to ask Lars about the credit. The, how do the payments work in that system? How does the, the, who pays if the all-to-all all, all, all all model? The prime broker gets paid for the credit, you get paid for the technology, and the other is a market making to each other? How, do, how does it work? I, I think th there's, two, there's two separate kind of mechanisms that are happening here from a technology perspective, and the credit point is very good. Here, you, you have a give up framework, right. and, and Treyana would be a great example of, of approaching some of that fragmentation that exists in the industry through a, a post trade and a give up framework that allows disparate entities to work with each other and then clear it back to a central point at the end of the day. But from a trading standpoint, these entities interacting against each other are, are, are going to clear and settle direct, excuse me, directly against each other. On the credit front, Lars, um, as Takis says, and we all, all agree, credit is very important in this marketplace. It's, it's the oil that keeps it to go. And prime brokerage was perhaps the, the biggest innovation that's happened in the last 20 years in this market. I mean, everything else seems to reflect a, a, a workflow that we had in the manual era. Prime brokerage, the separation of credit, 
and execution is new. The, um, the thing that's a little bit troubling, though, is there seem to be fewer and fewer prime brokers out there who are, who are, who are providing credit. Would you agree? Uh, <coughs> sure, there, there are fewer and fewer, I would say, relevant prime brokers. I think there's still you know, people trying right. uh, somewhat, but you know, they, they fail and they, they don't have the technology, they don't know, you know uh, how to approach it. Uh, they think that, you know, like in the old days, we can do onboarding in, in six to 12 months, but that's simply not acceptable these days. Uh, if if uh, a new participant, participant comes to the market, he, he doesn't want to wait six months before he gets going. You know, we, we need to get going next week. Uh, you know, we need to, to, to make money. Right. Uh, Lars, you're a prime of prime, aren't you? You're, yes. So, yeah, so you we don't provide credit yourself. You get it from somewhere else. So we you have fewer choices of where to get it from. There are still choices, but uh, you know, you, you, we have to be selective. Of course, we, we all know that uh, over the last month, uh, another couple of guys in London, they, they closed down. Uh, that's, of course, good, good for business for us, uh, in a way, uh, because they, these, the clients of, of, of these uh, prime brokers, they still need a place to go, and, and they don't have six months before they want to go trading again. They want to trade again uh, next week. So, so for, for us, being in, in the prime of prime space and having been there you know, for, for a couple of years, that's also the reason we changed our name, uh, sorry to correct you, from, from CFH Markets to CFH Clearing actually last year, uh, to, to emphasize uh, our focus on, on the prime of prime. Uh, but, but for us, it, you know, we have seen phenomenal growth in, in, in that space. Uh, it's twofold because we, we have the, the systems uh, to, to cater for it. You know, uh, prime broking has, it has two elements, it's, it's technology and, 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 uh, and credit. Uh, of course, uh, banks, they sit on the credit, we, but, but we, we bridge between the banks and, and, and the But, uh, but you have brokers. fewer places to get it from, so does that mean credit is going to become more expensive and prime brokerage is going to become more expensive? I think PB fees, uh, there were certain players, uh, you know, they were g g coming to the market with, with, I would say, call it close to ridiculous uh, rates. Uh, I, I struggle to see how uh, they were making money, or maybe they weren't because uh, they uh, left again. Um, so I, I think the, the, the PB fees, they, I still consider it to be fairly cheap to, to clear a ticket, uh, and, and, and I've, I don't think the the banks, they would scare anyone off by, by raising the price uh, slightly, uh, just to make it make, make sense for everyone. Do you think, Isaac, as a consumer of, pri of credit, that it's the price is going up? No, I, th I think credit is the lifeblood of foreign exchange trading. At the end of the day, it's a bilateral credit market. It's not a market like equities where you have a security that gets passed from one person to the next. Um, the thing to say about the web and technology, you know, when you have more than two liquidity sources, you have aggregation. Once you have three, four, five, six, ten, it all becomes the same thing if you have proper technology. To differentiate where flows go, it's all about who's taking risk and who's not taking risk. If you're an agency-based model, and that could be defined in many ways, but are you taking risk? Does a change in price affect your P&L? If the answer is no, then you're not taking risk. So at the end of the day, all flow eventually flows into risk takers. Now, some banks let, still take risk and, and have a mandate for it and some are reducing it, and then at the same time you get outside players who have a mandate of risk and they're using prime brokerage credit to facilitate trading. And this is the new dynamic. So I don't think that internalization is a threat to volume growth. I think mm -hmm. that it will spill over. There's a waterfall effect. Um, it's just a question of market volatility and volumes, which will bring the volumes back up. I, I would disagree and say that th there there are a lot of cases where you can take risk without necessarily being in a position and having the market go one way or another, and, it, and it's credit risk. It's, it's what we're talking about. And, and Robo is a great example of where, tech, sorry, I said the name, technology <laughs> really that would traditionally be accepted in the bank space. The, 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 the idea that we've papered up, we've done a diligence, and there's a balance sheet at JP Morgan versus uh, Morgan Stanley where I know the money is going to be there at the end of the day. So allowing a trade to act on EBS and then actually do the give up and the credit check afterwards is something that, that sounds, in, in the traditional FX world, is real. In, in, in the, the, the prime of prime and the clearing world and the new type of credit entities we're seeing now, that needs to happen pre-trade. And, right. and, and that, and that yeah, challenge and of happening. access to liquidity, mm. millisecond level trading, but also having pre-trade margin and the ability to, to, to check your counterparty before you allow them to transact on your system while still allowing them to do it fast is, an, is a very new technology challenge and probably something to the US 
FX market that's a little bit different than large tier one PBs interacting with each yeah. other. Millisecond credit checks is quite long, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> 50 yeah, microseconds. The volume, the volume of trading is all about the risk offset. Who's yeah. assuming risk and who's offsetting it. Um, all the prime brokerage credit, that's just being redistributed. Let, let, let's um, take a, a, we have to take one subject because it's, it's actually very visible in the market at this time, of course, and that is the fixing issue. The TAC is sort of indirectly alluded to it by saying there's, we, we've had some pressures in this market, and so there are fewer dealers. Um, here's the question. Do we need a fixing? The fixing's relatively new in this market. Uh, do, we, do we think we need a fixing at all? Because it's obviously brought us a lot of PR grief, worst PR issues since we were thrown out of the temple. But the, um, which, what, what, do we need a fixing? What is the function of a fixing, right? How do people use it? You, right now in the market, yes, we do need a fixing because trillions of dollars are dependent on uh, an independent rate to be valued at the end of the day. Mm. So the large asset managers, they need something to value the books at the end of the day. In the same way, you use the close, the equities close, to value your books at the end of the day. So the fixing serves that kind of function. What is also interesting is that if you execute the, if you hedge the flow that you, you have using the fixing rate as well as value it, then you don't have discrepancies in your book, in your valuation. And that's the attractiveness from the asset managers. Now, to compound the kind of use of that, there's a lot of legal agreements that fixing is written into. It. So it's very difficult right. to go and change all that. Uh, people are looking for solutions, but the solutions are not obvious. So do we need a fixing? We need a way to value portfolios. And after that, do we need a way, do we necessarily need to um, track this to a hedging rate? Not necessarily, you can trade throughout the day. It's just convenient. So I, w I would say we don't necessarily need the fixing. But we do need something that gives a, an independent valuation to the shareholders, the investors, of what the value of a portfolio is. Do it, could we do it multiple times a day? <coughs> yeah, and the, there's multiple yeah. fixes. I mean, there's a number of uh, uh, vendors out there that provide. The question is, how valuable is that if it's not linked in some real way to the portfolios? Like, if there's legal agreements, that has actual value. If there isn't, then it, it could be anything. Does anybody want to ask a question from, uh, from the floor? I'll ask uh, another one, if I may, then. Um, uh, the, the regulation. Lars, do, do, you, do you take customers in the United States? No. Uh, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and why don't you take customers in the United States? Uh, well, of course, we, we, you know, I do like the Americans. I've been here four days. Uh, great city, uh, great place, <laughs> and all of that. But uh, I, I think, you know, uh, the, the regulators here, they've, you know, ruined the market. I, I don't know how many brokers there were 10 years ago, but, you know, there's, is there one or two relevant left, maybe three? I, I, I don't even know the market here. Uh, you know, everyone seemed to be coming to London anyway. Uh, but we, we would not t take the risk and, and uh, even uh, mm -hmm. consider to do any business over here at this point in time. Do, do we want to go into what the risks are? Because, I mean, in some ways, foreign exchange has greater, has greater regulatory certainty, even in the United States, than other asset classes. I mean, we know that spot is not covered by Dodd-Frank. We know that uh, forwards are exempted largely from Dodd-Frank. We do have this problem with the rolling spot, but um, the, the, it's NDFs and so forth. So what, what, from your point of view in foreign exchange, what, what are the regulatory issues that the United States has, has uh, caused angst in? But to be honest, we haven't looked into it recently, but the, as far as I know that you, you need to have $25 million just to, to consider to do anything here. And, and uh, then there's a lot of reporting and, and I don't know what they, they use all this data for, and, and uh, you know what, what if they, they store it on, on, on some server, and you know probably delete it the following day. I, I, I don't I don't get it, and uh, you know as long as I don't get it, then I don't think we want to do business here. So it's it's the complicate it's the it's the complexity of it. David, do you you now run a SAF? I I know you're new in the job. I think you've been there 
been running that set for about three weeks now. Six weeks. Six weeks, yes. Sorry. So um, in your six weeks of experience with the SAF, how are you, uh, how, what's your, how do you view the Dodd-Frank regulations and the well, SAF rules? As it's, it's just been great. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, it, compared to obviously where we're coming from, um, which was a, a far sort of, a far looser regulatory um, uh, uh, framework, um, the, the, the CEF represents you know, the, the sort of the, the opposite of that. Um, a, a couple of things which I think are relevant to the conversation that we've been having is, first of all, this, this focus around, um, and this was I think echoed by other people on this panel, around the central limit order book being, um, uh, being the sort of the, the nirvana of trading, um, and therefore everything has to be central limit order books that are orientated, yeah. uh, is it, sort of, I think, surprising and as a main driver of, 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 uh, of what your technology needs to look like. Um, not actually reflective of the way that, that FX uh, has traditionally functioned or, or should function, given what people are trying to do with it from an economic perspective. Um, but the, the biggest issue is, 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 although you say that there is regulatory certainty, in some, in some ways there is also a lot of regulatory uncertainty, and it's all around timeframes. Uh, right. So at the moment, if you, if you want, so the fact that single banks are exempt from, uh, from being SEFs for the time being and, until, um, and, until clearing became, becomes manda mandated, um, and that you can still trade on the phone means that why on earth would you ever trade on a SEF unless you're basically making sure that all the pipes worked prior to something which is inevitably going to happen, um, actually happen. So at, at the moment, um, if you're just focusing on, on FX, and we're specifically focusing on FX from, from the, the perspective of the SwapX SEF, um, it, is an, it is sort of a, a business model that's waiting for regulation to actually reach the, sort of the, the point at which it was meant to have reached some time ago. Um, and become actually high, a highly relevant uh, vehicle within the industry. Um, that having been said, there's still lots of regulatory uncertainty about how it's going to interact or how MTFs in Europe fit into that whole framework. And, right. and, and, uh, and that doesn't seem to be going anywhere very pleasant at the moment in terms of the conversation between the two regulators. So, so, uh, so if we end up with this, uh, with a sort of a bifurcated or trifurcated or God knows what um, situation when it comes to liquidity where some liquidity is going to be on CEF, some liquidity is going to be on MTF, some liquidity is not going to be on either of those things. So as a, as a platform provider trying to satisfy the, uh, our, um, or technology provider specifically, trying to satisfy the requirements of all our various participants globally, having to sort of do different things in different places um, and chop up the sort of the, the value add that those could potentially provide if they were interacting with each other is, is somewhat painful, I have to say. And it would be great to see actually uh, the, the regulations moving forwards with a little bit more certainty and, and aggression. Well, one thing that, uh, if, if I may, that uh, if you go to other conferences in other asset classes, people worry a lot about futurization, which we don't hear, hear a lot about. Now, Isaac, um, at num you are one of the first bank dealers to deal on the CME futures. You, you were one of the early adopters. Uh, and I have to admit, when I was at EBS, we were quite worried that you were beginning to trade on the CME, which at that point we considered a big threat. Do you think that futurization of the instruments that are being forced onto SEFs or futurization of foreign exchange in general is, 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 is something that may happen? The CME seems to have grown well, but only grown as large as the other two large venues. Right. <coughs> so the futurization of of foreign exchange, um, you know, people use futures as a spot equivalent, stripping out the forward, um, and then, you know, putting the spot equivalent into the uh, aggregator. Um, I just want to say a little bit about um, futures, but more about CEFs in general. Um, I find regulation and CEFs to be a big equalizer and an opportunity. One of the reasons for striking out on my own is I consider um, open access to be an opportunity for someone like myself to create a company around trading products that are not just over, they're not just accessible today like futures are, but products like FX options and interest rate swaps and different types of OTC products which will eventually trade on SEFs and have open access. So <clears throat> the question then becomes, what's the difference between an OTC product and a exchange cleared product? And that has to do with fungibility, right? Are the products fungible? in a centralized clearer, or are they independent products that um, you have to take delivery on? Now, SpotFX doesn't have that issue because at the end of the day, it's a deliverable product, and even when you roll it, people take delivery. So 
I think you have to separate the trading side of it from the clearing side of it, right? Um, do I see um, more products trading like futures? Yes. The question is, when centralized clearing and, and open access are fully engaged, um, then it will become more practical. You know, to the point we just heard, CEPs today are, be, are, are being tailored around different um, industry participants' needs, right? History has proven that technology always wins and markets become open access. You can see that in equities. You can see that in spot foreign exchange. And, you know, eventually it'll trickle down to FX options and swaps and other products. So, um, you know, I think I, I, look at the, I look at the regulation if you can um, provide the proper legal and compliance staff to your team to be an opportunity. Um, it, again, it, it, cre it opens up markets and has new opportunities. But it's a lot more work, and it's very tedious. Very good. Is there any questions before? <laughs> uh, one, one question, perhaps, for one minute. I'm being signaled. Is somebody? Uh, no question. No questions from the from the floor. So, Andrew, you were. Um, your area is well regulated, though, isn't it? You're in each country, the CFTC here. Yeah. You're it depends on where I am. Uh, yes. and, and so we're not a regulated entity. We're, we're, we don't hold capital. Okay. I, I think to Lars's point, and I think to, to, the, to the CEF conversation in general, will, will CEFs and, and these centralized, cleared, and open markets be the answer for the rest of the world as that point of access? No. Um, I, I think, Lars, you, I, I sense some frustration in terms of the U.S. regulation on retail, but I, I'd be so bold to say that what that regulation did is created a framework in the U.S. that, that legitimized retail FX. You would not have seen gain capital, you would not have seen FXCM go public right. without a strong regulatory framework behind it. What I saw that do to the rest of the world is create a vision for creating an FX brokerage in the retail space that wouldn't necessarily only succeed by bucketing or internalizing risk, but be creating an exit strategy and a legitimate business model where you could build an FX brokerage and go public with it. And these same regulations, though sometimes screwy in the US, and Fortress is a, a big pain in the ass, but the, the, they're being rubber stamped. The Turkish regulation, which is working very well, is based a lot of what the NFA did. You see ASIC copying some things that worked and some things that didn't. So perhaps the, the, the CEF framework, this open market, it's not that everybody's going to come to the U.S. And, and, and then start trading on, on, on CME, and that's where futures around the world are going to happen, but we're leading the way in creating examples of how to legitimize and solve these problems that can then be rubber stamped around the world, which I think is very positive, well, waving my it, American it's flag. It's good to hear a positive view on the, uh, on the uh, uh, regulation. It's interesting because, of course, the person who has put it in place, Gary Gensler, was himself an FX dealer. That's where he began. So it's always been a puzzle as to how he was an FX dealer and the head of financial markets at Goldman Sachs in his time eventually, and then managed to put this in place. It's nice to hear an optimistic view on the regulation. Uh, anyway, well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. And so perhaps a, a round of applause for the panel. And <laughs> thank you.